South Korea ranks as the 12th largest economy in the world, with a GDP of over $7.7 .7 trillion. But in the wake of World War II, the newly created country was emerging from decades of war, occupation, and devastation. It would take a miracle to transform the state into a global center for technology and innovation. And a miracle on the Han River is exactly what they got. Through savvy international trade agreements, long-term investments, and state-led development, South Korea emerged as one of the most important trade partners for not only Asia, but also the world. The transition from an agricultural economy into one of the leading sources of technology and innovation has been one of the most successful sustained periods of economic growth in history, studied by economists the world over as a prime example of competent state-led development. However, the same internal powers that have brought South Korea so much wealth have also brought it to the brink of crisis. And with China and the United States both fighting to win over the capital of the valuable semiconductor industry, these forces threaten to cause chaos once more. Once upon a time in the Korean peninsula, amidst the ashes blossomed an economic rose. Yet, now between titanic squalls, thorns emerge. Modern-day South Korea is a result of World War II. After the United States dropped the first nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, the USSR moved into Korea, urging locals to fight against the Japanese, who had colonized Korea for the last three decades. The movement of the Russians unsettled the Americans, who were fearful of Soviet expansion. Under orders, two American officers stationed in South Korea were tasked with quickly designating an American zone of occupation. They decided to split the country in two, using a National Geographic map, making sure that the city of Seoul would be inside the zone appropriated to the Americans, while anything north would be left to Russian forces. Russia agreed to the border and so in August 1945, Korea was officially divided along the 38th parallel. However, it took time for this government to take shape. There was initial confusion over who would be claiming power, whether the Americans were arriving or if the Russians would venture further south to take Seoul. The US occupied the south helping to form the Republic of Korea. North Korea also had a powerful ally after supporting the victorious communist PLA in the Chinese Civil War. When North Korea was forced to retreat, China committed up to 70,000 soldiers and weapons to conquer South Korea. The stage was set for the anti-communist crusaders in the United States to fight against North Korea, China, and the Soviet Union. By 1953, after three violent years and over three million killed, the Korean War ended. Prisoners of war were exchanged, but tensions remained high. As the dust settled, two radically different trajectories solidified. The North was on its way to becoming a rogue state, allied to the Soviets and China, while South Korea wanted to slingshot off of American development to join the First World. After the military conflict ended, like many states, South Korea was a deeply fractured society in the process of rebuilding its economy. It was one of the poorest countries in the world, with a GDP of just $67 per capita. The Japanese had led measured industrialization, though most of that was located in the northern part of the state, now controlled by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which accounted for 80% of electric power generation, as this was where much of the industry and mining was based. The South Korean agricultural sector was in much need of development too. Land that was taken by the Japanese was reallocated to South Korean farmers, as a way of land equalization. The country was in a substantial food deficit, meaning there was large imports, especially of food grains. The state's policies towards agriculture were as much directed by politics as economics. By the 1950s, rural populations were rarely organized against the state. The land reforms had worked to neutralize any political instability from the countryside. With the farming populated placated, it meant that initially subsidies and state protection were instead granted to the fledging industrial sector in a decades-long effort to attract foreign capital. With the outbreak of the Korean War, these industries were given a boost, causing the government and domestic investors to quickly evolve beyond the colonial system. South Korea had nationalized the sectors of railroad, electricity, telecommunications, and the postal service after taking over from the Japanese. With large control over the economy, the state pursued export-oriented industrialization, effectively selling its cheap labor to foreign markets to strengthen its own enterprises. 
As South Korea's industry picked up, farmers were being urbanized. In response, the government deliberately raised purchasing prices of rice, effectively subsidizing both grain producers. High-yield rice varieties were also introduced to increase the output of the agricultural economy. Again, these policies were designed to placate the agricultural population as well as to keep strong a staple of the economy. As was the ambition of the state, industry was rapidly replacing agriculture as the dominant sector of the economy. However, some savvy diplomacy would be needed to break into new industries. The percentage of agricultural workers had been declining since Japanese rule. After South Korean independence, most urbanizing workers moved into non-manufacturing work. Manufacturing companies were hiring younger people, usually new entrants to the workforce. This manufacturing boom was key to the export-oriented industrialization of the South Korean state. But it wasn't going to be enough to push the economy to the next stage of development, from labor-intensive to capital-intensive high-value added production. For that, South Korea's key partner was the state which secured their independence. After World War II, the clear leader of the global economy was now the US. But global demand was short. There was a shortage of US dollars internationally, something that was anticipated to stunt American dominance. The US aided the imports of products around the world to boost demand and set about rebuilding key markets. One of these was South Korea. However, the US's regional economic strategy centered around Japan. South Koreans were hesitant to fall into the Japanese sphere of influence again after 35 years of colonial oppression. Up until the 1960s, under US guidance, South Korea was following a program of import substitution industrialization, keeping it relatively autonomous from its rival neighbor, Japan. With the election of John F. Kennedy's administration, though, foreign policy changed dramatically. The US pulled resources from South Korea, which forced the state to improve relations with Japan. The two countries had a mutually beneficial position. Japan had capital during its post-war boom, and South Korea desperately needed investment and technology. With South Korea now liberalizing its economy, it was ready for a miracle. By the mid-1960s, South Korea had already been through two republics and a period of military rule. With the Third Republic, the country made an effort to eliminate systematic corruption and grow the economy. The new president, Park Chung-hee, announced a five-year economic development plan which committed investment to infrastructure, roads, railways, and ports were improved. While valuable commodities industries producing oil, iron, and steel, and the energy sector were vital for the long-term economic plan, the private sector was boosted too. Low interest loans were given out easily to desirable businesses. South Korea was criticized internationally for its poor human rights record, which limited individual and press freedoms. However, the government reasoned that the young country was not ready for full democracy. The economy needed to be transformed first. And it worked. The Third Republic oversaw a period of rapid industrialization. So successful was this period that it later became known as the Miracle on the Han. Far from a miracle though, South Korea achieved a booming economy through state-led initiatives and leveraging its geopolitical position. Throughout the 1960s, South Korea's growth depended on foreign aid, including reparations from Japan. The United States was a valuable partner for support. However, more still needed to be done to boost the development of the economy. During the Vietnam War, South Korea sent 300,000 soldiers to support the United States under one condition. South Korean companies would be major contractors in supplying the South Vietnamese economy. This helped the early development of companies like Hyundai. South Korea was committed to achieving economic autonomy and began cutting foreign exemptions. At the same time, the United States began withdrawing its support, though continued to be the leading trade partner for South Korean exports. It was this point, this critical moment, that South Korea started pivoting towards what would become its most important industry, electronics. During the 1980s, the automobile, electronics, and semiconductor industries made up the major exports of the country, led by companies like LG and Daewoo. These were industries decades in the making. South Korea created the Ministry of Science and Technology, signaling a shift towards highly technical areas of production. Along with the creation of increased educational opportunities, the country was building a knowledge economy that was well suited to lead major export-driven sectors like electronics, information, and technology. This included what is now known as Dadiok Inopolis, an area home to 232 research and educational institutions as well as more than 40 corporate research centers and thousands of PhD researchers. With a renewed focus, the economy shifted from the manufacturing sector from textiles to advanced machinery and electronics, 
which have been vital in growing the knowledge economy. With the adoption of an export-led economic model, state-led investment in science and technology became crucial for the long-term health of the state. South Korea was also one of the earlier states to move in favor of the internet, establishing a TCP IP network called SDN, or System Development Network. Between 1960 and 1990, South Korea had an average growth rate of 8%, meaning that the economy doubled almost every decade. This kind of rapid, consistent growth was only matched by very few East Asian governments. Most of these, like Singapore and Hong Kong, had small populations. South Korea was managing a much bigger population of between 20 and 40 million people. But state-led didn't mean state-owned. The companies propelling the economy were controlled by a handful of dynasties. Although it initially appeared that the government was in charge, after three decades of unprecedented growth, it became clear who was really calling the shots. One of the most important forces in South Korea rarely gets public attention. They are called the Chaebol. Translated, the word refers to a financial group, family, or wealth clan. These are conglomerates that are almost entirely owned and run by a single family. The stem from a new class of business owners rose to dominance after the colonial Japanese government left the country. Then, when much of South Korean productive forces were destroyed during the Korean War, the South Korean government selected several prominent families to help distribute commodities, bank loans, and materials. They were given guaranteed state backing to incentivize further investment. This had the effect of restarting the economy, but also entrenched these family businesses into the state. In 1969, when the government gave the green light to an eight-year program of electronic subsidies, it fueled the growth of companies like Samsung. The Korean War allowed the company to begin to expand and diversify, spreading into a range of different industries, including electronics. By the 1980s, the electronics division was committing to ambitious research and development, in line with the government's pivot towards an innovation-led strategy. As much as the South Korean government tried to distance itself from the entrenched corruption of the Japanese and the immediate post-war government, the Chaebol system had created a new kind of corruption. The political class worked hand-in-hand -hand with the Chaebol, sanctioning high-value projects. Competition within international companies and between chables was fierce, but change from within came slowly. The corporate culture of the chable is shaped by family relationships. Successors of chairmen and executives are almost exclusively related to the same family. This makes them resistant to change and averse to outsider influence. While the national economy seemed to be booming, these internal systemic problems were unsustainable. One of the major drawbacks was that the rate of technological innovation was hamstrung. Foreign capital in the form of equipment was a high cost to the domestic economy, and South Korea was still relying on its cheap labor force as a major export. This made the economy vulnerable to a looming crisis in the 1990s. By the end of it, the largest chable would be out of business in one of the biggest bankruptcies in history. Between 1997 and 1999, amid the Asian financial crisis, more than one-third of the biggest chables collapsed. Some were able to take advantage of a weakened domestic currency to expand operations internationally, but the collapsed economy of key regional neighbors proved too much pressure for most. By far the biggest of these was the second largest in the country, the Daewoo Group, collapsed in 1999, defaulting on $80 billion worth of debt, making it still one of the largest corporate collapses in history. More than 40 executives were charged by the government with accounting fraud, with the chairman, Kim Woo Chong, eventually arrested. Less than a year later, though, he was granted amnesty by the president, avoiding any punishment. Meanwhile, the rest of the chables were allowed to roll over on their loans when repayments were not possible, the idea being that they had become too big to fail. This showed the deep relationship and dependency the state has on the chables. While previous South Korean governments had not been willing to take on the chables effectively, the International Monetary Fund forced it to take action. The country had no choice. It was suffering from foreign debt of over $150 billion. In the labor market, unemployment rose to 2 million, 8% of the workforce. South Korea saw its asset prices slashed to around half their previous value as a wave of capital flight swept the nation. When the IMF offered a bailout package of $58 billion, the biggest in history, South Korea couldn't refuse. The bailout came with conditions. 
to restructure the economy, implement labor reform, tighten monetary policy, and liberate the market for foreign investment. The IMF also wanted the Chable system to be dramatically reformed. In 1999, the Chable dropped their debt-to-equity ratios to under 200% in line with the South Korean government's orders to minimize their exposure. Major corporations, which had made up so much of their exports, were forced to strip their assets which opened up these enterprises to foreign direct investment. Tighter regulation of financial markets, stricter monetary policy, and monitoring of foreign exchange liquidity were part of the sweeping changes. These were the final modifications needed to pave the way for an era of South Korean tech dominance. Targeted investment from the government in broadband and the semiconductor market was essential to the recovery from the global financial crisis of 2007, and by 2010, the economy was beginning to rebound. South Korea is now the highest ranked country for digital infrastructure, with 99.96% of households with access to broadband, 87% with a fiber optic high speed connection, and an average speed of 105 megabytes per second, the fastest in the world following the UAE. It was also the first country to roll out the 5G network in 2019, growing to include over 80 cities around the country. By the end of 2022, there were 28 million 5G subscribers, and other countries are looking to South Korea as the future leader in the development of 6G technology. But public policy cannot be separated from the continued relevance of Chables. As the major economic driver, Chables have become embedded within South Korean culture, especially Samsung, which by 2013 was posting over $300 billion in revenue. This only gathered pace over the last decade, which has seen it radically increase its semiconductor manufacturing as a global shortage positioned them perfectly to feed the growing demand for handphones, laptops, and electronics. In 2017, it overtook Intel to become the world's biggest chip maker. Today, South Korea is a global leader in science, technology, and innovation, scoring highest on the e-government index. To maintain this dominance, the government has announced plans to construct a huge computer chip facility that will be the world's biggest high-tech system semiconductor cluster. Samsung alone will be investing $230 billion in the operation. Electronics is now the country's most important sector, both domestically and internationally. But it will also make South Korea a battleground for a war between a traditional supporter and an emerging superpower. Like many of the East Asian states, South Korea knows that its relationship with both superpowers, China and the United States, was best maintained through bilateral trade agreements and remaining politically neutral. But the time has come to make a choice. Earlier this year, President Biden announced billions of dollars in subsidies, investments, and capital for South Korean companies. Hyundai is set to receive $5 billion in a joint venture with General Electric, targeted at electric vehicle battery production. And it's not just industry. The domestic consumer market of South Korea is proving an important region for expansion. Netflix is planning to invest $2.5 billion into the country for the production of Korean entertainment. The help of the United States government doesn't come for free, though. South Korea will need to abide by a range of US restrictions, which would effectively limit China's integration with the economy. Meanwhile, Chinese President Xi Jinping personally visited the LG factory in Guangzhou, emphasizing that China is a big and important trading partner for South Korea. China has already told South Korea that if it bets on China's defeat, then they will definitely regret it. Given South Korea's crucial position in the technology industry and its big plans for semiconductors, it's no surprise that the war is heating up. Creating an economic miracle and long-term infrastructure investments have put South Korea in a strong position. But one wrong move will threaten their relationship with either the United States or China, either of which could be disastrous. This has been another episode of Meridian Mindset. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and leave a comment down below. We also just launched a new Twitter account, so please give us a follow at Meridian Mindset and check out our other socials as well.